Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dreams show. I'm your host Manoj Agarwal and today we'll be talking with Art Levin. So Art is the owner and creative director of Executive Clothiers, one of the nation's premier bespoke clothing company. Art has designed for and suited up some of the most successful and powerful entrepreneurs and business people in the world now for over 30 years. His exclusive custom made and ready to wear designs are seen on clients from the international corporate world to Hollywood red carpet events. Some of his loyal clients include royal family members and other famous celebrities like Hugh Hefner, Sylvester Stallone, Robert Wagner, Michael Clark, Eric Roberts, Terry Crews, Ernie Johnny uh, Ernie Johnny Carson, um Steve Allen, Johnny Carson, Bill Maher and so on. I can go on and on the huge list here. Uh, Art is considered one of the leading experts on direct marketing, corporate image consulting, and is the leading custom clothier to California's most prominent people in business and entertainment. He has been featured in Los Angeles Times, CNN, Esquire, GQ, My Fox 11, Wall Street Journal, Hispanic Business Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine, LA Business Journal, and many, many more. Um, Art is also the founder of PBN, a professional business networking group. with more than 10,000 online members art sits on the executive committee board and chairs the membership committee at the city club on bunker hill a prestigious members only executive private club i'm so excited to talk to you art likewise good art. to meet you manoj same here same here so uh, you have done tremendously well uh, especially in the fashion industry but uh, let's uh, uh, uncover a little bit of your story how did you get started in this field of work I started um gosh I, we're going back 31 years I was a kid I was 22 years old and I was selling pagers door to door wow. you know so I was knocking on doors and I happened to knock on a tailor's door 1989 way back then and um he uh he uh, he loved what I did and how I I presented myself so he recruited me in the business way back then Oh I see uh, So did you have a knack for dressing up well at that uh, age as well You know what I've been dressing up I've been dressing up since I was like 3 years old I I have pictures of me in custom suits I'm from Chile originally right and I I can I, I grew up very modest and we didn't have much so when you grow up without much you're somebody in your family is a tailor and they make the clothes for you and that's kind of how I got started and I've always enjoyed dressing up and uh that's kind of what he liked that gentleman his name was Prakash Vaswani Mm-hmm. and uh uh he was from india and he was a tailor here in la and and uh, he recruited me and and he loved my uh, my style awesome oh, and so um what is it about about dressing up like can you can uh, let's before we get into the you know the business i want to dig a little bit deeper because a lot of people um you know including me i i don't pay too much attention to what i wear so um So what is your take on it like how does it change the personality what is the significance of dressing up well you know what this is how i see it and when i talk and when i talk to colleges and and these young kids coming up and the young executives i tell them it's like this i don't know if you've ever bought a brand new car right off the lot of a of a car dealership but the best feeling is you know you get out of that car and you're driving you lower the window open up the sunroof and you're like oh, wow this is a nice car and the same thing it goes with a suit or a shirt and and that's kind of what I do. It's not that I sell clothing, I sell the feeling. Yeah. The feeling how good it feels to wear a really really nice suit that fits you better than anything and it it gets the it gets the the word across. You don't have to say a word when you walk into a room. People know that you're dressed successful. I mean th- there's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you grew up in Chile. When did you come over to USA? I I came here in 1977. I was a young kid. I was 8 or 9 years old. Um yeah, and we came my dad came first in 1970, then my mother in 1972, then myself and one of my brothers in 1977, and then I have two more brothers and a sister a year or two later. So it took about 8 or 9 years before our, our family uh came back together. Wow. So was there a challenge in getting assimilated into the US culture and uh, and the language barriers and things like that? 
Well, the language barrier for sure, because I didn't know a word of English. You know, I only knew, I knew a couple of things. But when I came to the United States, I still didn't know that I was in America, you know, because everything was in Spanish coming from San Diego. San Diego, that's in Spanish. La Jolla, uh, and Los, even Los Angeles, Los Angeles, right? And so I, I really didn't believe that I was still in America. So it was new to me until I started seeing, hearing people talk. And that's when I really knew that I was in the United States. So it was kind of a need. So I didn't know one word of English. And... And I have a really good friend till now. His name is Craig Jaffe. He taught me how to speak English. Wow. Yeah. Right. So uh, what happened then, you know, once you met the tailor uh, who, who started probably teaching you how to, how to do this? So what was the next step in your journey there? So what happened, he started teaching me from the basics, um, from it's, it's called a fitting, okay? So when you go see a tailor, they fit you, they put pins on you, they chalk you up with chalk. Um, that's how I started. And then from there, I moved into sales. And I did very, very well for him because my whole background is sales, sales and marketing. And prior to me um, meeting this tailor, I had 20, 25 jobs before that. Wow. I was trying to find myself. I was trying to find myself just because um, I didn't finish school, you know, and I, I was trying to find something I was going to be really, really good at. And I found clothing. And that was the best thing I ever, I ever did. Yeah. So um, tell us how you got so successful at it, because, you know, obviously there are other people who uh, uh, make bespoke uh, uh, sure. suits and clothing. But how did you become so, so famous and, you know, work with all these successful people? So, you, you know, you know, before, like I said, I always go back to my before jobs because I don't know anything else. Right. So before I, I was all I was doing is direct sales. So that means door knocking. Right. Uh -huh. So I was cold calling, door knocking. And I took that same formula into clothing. So I was calling on really rich people, you know, and I, just like I was calling a normal person. So I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have phone phobia like most people do, right? I didn't have that. I just called every single person that was on my list, whether they were a billionaire back then or whether or not. To me, it was the same thing. And that's how I started getting a lot of these really wealthy clients from the beginning mm. because I was scared of calling them and, and they were open to it because it was a great idea. I will go to their office and sell them clothing in their office, make it nice and convenient for them, be in and out in 15 minutes instead of two to four hours going shopping. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like uh, you know these rich clients are available to anyone who has the confidence um, and they have something to offer to these people. Will you say that's that's correct? That's correct. Yeah, because, you know, I, I'll listen to anybody who calls me on the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to hear their pitch. I want to hear what they're saying. I want to hear what they're not saying right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and I, sometimes I tell them, I said, listen, this is what you did wrong. That's why I'm not right. Yeah. But it's they, I, hopefully they appreciate it and learn from that. That's how I did it. I mean, that's where I learned. And, and I was just, I was I was a prospecting selling machine that's all i did all day long prospect 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 that's and right. uh, and then the referral started coming in that's great and uh, i can attest to that because the, when i invited you to the podcast it, the conversation was about a minute and you asked me bam 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 okay you know what is it about and and you're like okay yeah let's do it <laughs> yeah i mean that's how it is you know because with these guys these the the wealthier they are the less time they have right so i try to get to the point right away and i learned that because for 31 years, all I, all my clients are successful. So I learned how to deal with them. Some clients tell me, all right, you got four minutes as I'm measuring them in the elevator going up to their office. <laughs> so I've done it in an elevator. I've done it. I, I dress, I fit people in a bathroom. You know, they give me four minutes. Yeah. You know, I remember one that one client told me, you got four minutes. I'm like, whoa, okay, let's do it. <laughs> you know? All right. So um, why bespoke clothing? Because, you know, uh, the world is moving towards mass market and, you know, ready-made clothes and everything. So sure. what what is your take on that, you know, uh, mass market produced clothing versus bespoke clothing? Well, the, the reason I went bespoke is because it's a, it's a niche. It's a, it's a very specialized niche, just like Ferrari. You know, they have $400,000 cars. They have a great market, Rolls Royce, right? All these high-end cars, high-end high -end homes, you know, it's, there's a market for that. It's not for everybody, but I don't care about everybody. I just care about the one, two percenters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's where I go after. So um, but is that, does it contribute the, the fact that it is bespoke? Does it contribute to the status, to the, to the, the way they present themselves? Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. So it's a status thing. It's like wearing a Rolex. It's a status thing. Um, you know, it's, it's when, when, you, when you reach a certain level, 
it's uh, you buy things just to buy them and because it's a status thing. Um, I remember going back 20 something years ago, I bought my first Rolex and somebody told me, buy yourself a Rolex, you know, you'll see a different clientele. And sure enough, because now I could spot a Rolex from 30 feet away, you know, I could spot a really good watch. And, and it's not, I'm not trying to brag here, but I'm just, yeah, trying, yeah. To, I'm just trying to express what fine things do. And as you grow in life and as you grow financially, people see that, you know, the value, the value. And how, how has your craft changed? Have you um, started adopting new styles or have you adopted uh, new fabrics as you have started working with these, uh, these uh, famous people? That's a, that's a really good question because I study every day. Every day I study, I drive, my, I drive my wife crazy, but that's that's me. I can't help that. So in order for me to keep a, keep in the edge of what I do, the best of what I do, I'm the best. I have the most knowledge than I think any of my competitors because I study every night, no matter what. Every night I study. And I've been studying for 31 years. So, so I, have you, a, I have my PhD, my MBA in bespoke clothing. You know? That's awesome. So when you, when you say you study, like what, could you give us a little bit of a... Um, uh, behind the scenes look of what exactly are you looking because a lot of people you know I, I notice when they get successful in a particular field whether that's uh, you know uh, their professional job or their business they start to get complacent and they're like you know uh, they're not ready for a, for you know the kind of crisis we are going through today so I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into your methodology like what is it that you study so what I study, first of all, is the styles, right? The styles change all the time. Uh, what I my are in, in the bespoke world, we type, we like to keep our, our clients uh, timeless and classic. But still, so, timeless and classic means we can still make the suit a little slimmer, not as baggy, right? So that's one. Two, the fabric. So my mill came out with a with a fabric right now. It's a COVID, a COVID re, um uh, what do you call it? It's COVID proof. So they put they put some sort of chemical on the wool that it prevents from 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 saliva or anything staying on your suit, so it goes away. It's kind of, that's kind of really really neat. Um, same with the mask. We have water repellent mask, so nothing sticks to the mask. So everything we're coming out with new new things that that clients enjoy. Wrinkle resilient wool which means that it's a high twist wool. I don't want to get technical because it's really technical. It's a high twist wool that you could roll it up, drive with it. I drive with my suit on every single day. I don't take it off. I don't take off my coat. So at the end of the day, I still look as fresh as I did at seven in the morning. And it's, it's called wrinkle resilient. It's, it's unheard of in the, in, in the suit industry. Most wool wrinkles and ours doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every, every, it could be everything. It could be it could be the way that the lapels hang, it could be the the pockets. It could be I study everything. So that's that's how I study that. That's great. And sales and marketing, and uh, you know I, that's another thing I noticed. Most of the successful entrepreneurs they are really good at marketing and sales. So uh, yes. what are your views? Like how has um, that aspect of business changed over the last thirty years? You know what. We're, we're still old school, and, and since I've learned how to market, prospect the old school way, you know, knocking on doors, I don't do that anymore, but I have people that do that, calling on the phones, making appointments. My job today, all I do now is just my, my staff will schedule appointments for me, and my job is to show up to the appointments and just sell. That's my job. But what they do is what I used to do back then, and that's cold calling. That's prospecting, that's email blast, that's all the stuff, social media, all the stuff that goes in it now to to keep up. On, it's We call it TOMA, top of mind awareness, T-O-M-A. It's mm -hmm. called TOMA. So we do, we try to keep TOMA um, with all our clients, top of mind awareness. So when you think of clothes, you think of me, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so it, seems like, it seems like you had to adopt uh, email systems, social media marketing. These yeah, absolutely. Are, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, what about uh, the effects of the pandemic, the global crisis now, people are locked down. Has that affected your business in any way or uh, forced well, you? In, initially, initially it did because every everything was locked down. There's nothing we could do. It was out of my hands, out of my control. I'm kind of a control freak as it is, but this was out of my control. I, I couldn't do anything. My my The buildings where we lease uh, uh, commercial 
property from, they closed the entire building down. So we couldn't even get into our building. So I was shut down for about four months. But in those four months, what I did, I just pushed my online sales higher. So that's what I concentrated on. And that's kind of what, what we did. So we kind of shifted a little bit. So, so as an entrepreneur, you have to understand exactly what is going on in the marketplace and make adjustments. You know, Manuj, you, you, I got lost you there for a second. Say that again. Uh, so I'm saying uh, as an entrepreneur, you have to be flexible and make sure that you can understand the market conditions. And Absolutely. You have to be flexible in everything you do. You can't just think one way because that one way, if your focus is driven on, on one way, it's not going to work. It might work for a minute, but you're going to have to switch, you know? Yeah. So you have to be able, you're very, very um, uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. And um, seems like you've been in, a, uh, in the business for a long time and you may have seen other crises. I mean, 2008 financial crisis, 2000, uh, you know, dot com bo uh, bubble. So, um, uh, you know, bespoke clothing obviously is a very price sensitive. I mean, it's related to the price and uh, overall economy. Um, yeah. When these kind of shifts happen, how do you how do you stay motivated? How do you stay focused? And how do you motivate your team to keep going? You know, that's it's a great question because that's it's a very hard thing to do. But I'm very motivated myself. You know, it's and I'm very enthusiastic, and as we all know, enthusiast enthusiasm is contagious. Mm -hmm. So I keep my my team going just by my 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 positive attitude, not only in life but in my business. And and what we do, we just do different things. We have more meetings, right? We have just how to do things better, how to keep motivated, how to keep driven, and have a purpose. I'm very purpose driven, so. Um, I don't. I haven't used an alarm clock in 30 years just because my my purpose is what wakes me up, you know. Uh, and so, um, what about? Let's talk about your um, and the the professional networking group that your business uh, networking group that you have found. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So in the 2007 2008 crisis, the the uh, the real estate recession um, that hit everybody hard, including me. It, it hit me a little bit later, it hit me in 2008. So in 2008, I saw my business just going down and down. So I had to create something, recreate myself. Remember we were talking about that earlier. So I had to recreate myself really, really quick and be flexible. So what I started doing, uh, I was a member of a private uh, private club in downtown LA. It's called a city club. It's a high-end um, uh, private club. And so what I started doing, I started having lunch there for selected people. So if you could afford a hundred dollar lunch, that was kind of like you could afford my my suit, right? Oh, so what wow. I created, I created professional business network like that, and then that lunch with ten people it grew to fifty, and then a hundred, and then it was it just it's it's like having a virtual sales team. I see. So having a virtual sales team, so that group, everybody from that group, I only allow one per category, so only one plastic surgeon one doctor or, or one uh, one attorney from a specific field so one eye doctor one dentist so all the leads that came through that we gave it to that person and we're exchanging about eight hundred thousand dollars a week in leads wow yeah i mean through the whole group you know yeah, yeah. so if there was a real estate person they made a million dollar sale that's their stuff we don't make any we didn't make any commission that was just part of being part of the pbn I see. I see. So now, from what I understand, you have ten thousand members. There's a, yeah. There's about ten thousand online members now. Wow. And so, how does it compare to other groups uh, like you know uh, BNI and uh, and similar uh, networking groups? Another great question. I studied BNI and I studied Latif. So they have meetings at Chili's and in Denny's. I don't know if you know. Are familiar with those restaurants? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can buy a steak for eight dollars. No, yeah. that's not what I want. Those <laughs> those guys can't afford me. You know. So that was the wrong. I was look. I was I was looking at them because of the network effect. You know, networking is really really important in any business. But I don't want the people that could afford only an eight dollar steak. I want the people who could afford a ninety nine dollar steak. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I created my own, and I created high end because that's what I wanted. I wanted to attract, and that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it seems like you you have a you know you have a flair for building things and growing them uh, from the ground up and you you've done it multiple times uh can you uh, help us uh, or help people who are who are maybe they are at the beginning of the journey or they want to reinvent themselves due to this 
uh, global health crisis. What right. is your process of you know coming up with an idea and then sort of implementing it? Because as you know, ideas are dime a dozen, but execution it uh, is where it uh, makes the difference. So, what are your secrets to success in in terms of execution? It's, it's really simple. It's take action. Really simple. You know, I've come up with thousands of ideas. I still do. But, you know, I still focus on one thing, that my primary business, which is clothing. And then from there, I take it from to other businesses and other investments and real estate and stuff like that. But I always tell people, you know, they I get people calling me every day or coming up to my office every day saying, all right, I got a great idea. I say, what, what are you doing with this? I said, well, I don't know. I haven't. I said, take action. Some people want to want to have the perfect business. Right. Or they, want, they have a perfect plan. There's no perfect plan. You just have to go for it. And most people are scared to go for it, and that's where they fell. So yeah. I said, just go for it. You know, go for it. You cannot be perfect. You'll you'll fix yourself along the way. So and you'll learn what not to do along the way. But taking action is the most important thing. That's that's been my number one success tool. I see. So um, I absolutely agree with that. You know, action is where it is. But um, when you take action, you also make mistakes. You run into uh, you know difficulties. You run into disasters sometimes. Um, so can you share some some of these kind of experience like have you run into any disaster scenarios or or is there anything like that you know i i have let me tell you something i and I, I i bought a home a long time ago right and this is what i did i took action i destroyed everything in my home because it was an older home it was an investment and i just jackhammered everything right uh -huh. and uh i jackhammered the bathrooms so I didn't have bathrooms, you know. I said, oh, "Well, what do we do? We get a hotel, right?" So that was just one example, and then that's how I, that's how I do it. I go for it. If I make mistakes, I fix it and continue going. I see. And what about um, you know? I, I've I've been to your website, and it seems like you have put together a dream team uh, to be able to reach that kind of success. You know, I, I believe you have to have a very strong team to support support you and and be able to uh, you know. Um, uh, be champion of the ideas that you are putting out there, right? So, what Absolutely. are your what are your theories about hiring, finding, hiring, and retaining top employees and and team members? You know the those team members that you saw on my website. I've had them for years. Um, some of them are some of my best friends from way back. Um, most of those people they've been working with me ten plus years, and I take care of them. Well, I treat them like family. You know. We go and have lunch together. We have go, and anytime they, they're around me, they don't pay because I take care of everything. And I treat them like family. So, you know, it's like, I'm the godfather of my little family, right? So I I, I, I take care of them on their birthdays. And, and I love, if it wasn't for that team that I have now, I could not be where I am today. It's super, super important. I couldn't do all of their work. I used to, not anymore all of their work because it's, you know, I can't now, I need, I need that team. And for me to need them, I take care of them. Okay. Um, so one of the questions I asked, cause I, I grew up in India and I uh, migrated over to North America. Um, uh, and you know, every uh, guest who comes onto the show who has lived in multiple parts of the world, I asked them, uh, did your cultural background contribute to, to your success? Uh, having a different perspective, living in different parts of the world, how did that um, help you in your in your career? I grew up, like I said, I grew up very, very poor. Mm -hmm. And coming here, um, we were very, very modest. There was eight of us in one bedroom. I'm, I'm sorry, a one bathroom, three bedroom house, 900 square feet. So I had friends that lived in mansions. And I think from early on in high school, mm -hmm. or maybe even a little bit younger, my friends, I, I used to dream, I said, man, how can my friends have those big homes? And that's how I started. I think my first girlfriend was like 14, 15. She was she came from a very wealthy family and had a huge mansion. And then they took me to nice restaurants. And that's what I enjoy today. It's uh, nice restaurants, uh, nice homes, nice cars. But it, it kind of put a really a drive in me. And that drive that I have, it's undeniable. If you met me in person, you could tell. You could, I, you know, I'm like a magnet. You know, you, you could tell my tribe. And that's what people tell me all the time. It's like, how are you so driven today, 31 years later, more than you were 31 years ago? It's just today is not about money anymore. It's about being the best that I am in my business. I see. So um, that's a very important point. A lot of people, they, uh, you know, I think uh, that's where they sort of miss the boat there. You know, they keep running after money. And even when they acquire the money, uh, they find it's not very, very satisfying. It's not 
fulfilling. Um, so uh, it, it seems like you just want to be the best at what you do, uh, and money is a byproduct. Is that is that correct understanding? That's, that's pretty much what it is. I'm I'm very proud. I'm very proud of what I do. I think we're the best at what I do. And and again, not being cocky, we just being confident about our product and about how we do it and why we do it. And yeah, when you do something really good, money just comes. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah. even think about it anymore. It just comes. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And so, you know, uh, you obviously have worked with a lot of uh, famous people. Any interesting stories that uh, that you recall? Anything that you can share? I mean, I have some really cool stories. Uh, there's one gentleman, um, very, 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 very well known. I can't tell you who it is. Yeah, yeah. But when I first met him, and this is really interesting, when I first met him, he wouldn't look at me. He'll look at his assistant, mm -hmm. right? So I had to talk to his assistant, his assistant will tell him right in front of me, right? Two, three feet away. And, <laughs> then, and it was the funniest thing. But once, about four months later, once he invited me to his house, things change. Mm -hmm. these, these superstars, um, they're very insecure about bringing someone new into, into the world. Mm -hmm. And once they get to know me and they know that I don't spread any root to me, when they come to me, I'm, I'm, I'm like a, I'm not only their tailor, but their barber. You don't spread the word, you know, you don't gossip. You, yeah. you know, yeah. I've never in my 31 years have said anything about any of my clients, what they told me in private. Mm -hmm. And so they get to know that about me. And on top of that, I get referred to them. So the, the trust is there. I just have to bring that trust a little higher. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Pretty um, interesting. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, some of them are uh, already successful. Some of them are just starting their journey. Any message that you may want to share with uh, with these entrepreneurs, especially in a time like this? You know, I, I, I co-author co a book called The, the Hustler Code. Okay. I'm, I'm writing my second book now. It's called Tailor Made Success for okay. Entrepreneurs from learning from some of the wealthiest people in the world from me, right? So I, what when I sign my books, I, I always put on there, keep pushing, keep driven, and have purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's that, those three key words, they take you a long, long way because people, they dream, but they have no action. Or mm -hmm. they have, they dream and they, they don't pursue it, right? Or they have no purpose. When you don't have purpose, you're going to just, you're going to wing it in life. You're not going to like where you end up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, uh, a follow up question there will be, you know, a lot of people, they say, okay, I'm, 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 I'm really hardworking. I want to take action, but the economy is not good. You know, I don't have the savings to put into my business or, you know, they come up with a lot of excuses basically. So uh, what kind of message uh, uh, that uh, we can give to them? You know, it's um, what I always tell you young people is, is let's say, for example, you want to get in, into my business, right? Into clothing. Obviously you're not going to do the numbers I do today, but come and work for someone like me or some, you know, go to Nordstrom's and if you want to get in the clothing, go work for somebody, let them finance you for a couple of years, learn as much as you can. Then you go out on your own. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good advice. That's yeah. Good. You know, you learn from the inside out, but you learn on somebody else's pay, you know, yeah, yeah. That's not great. in your Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been very interesting conversation. Thank you. Uh, I know you're so busy and uh, coming onto the show, uh, sharing your experience. Uh, sharing a few uh, nice stories. Uh, now, before I let you go, can you tell us how people can find you and connect with you? It's uh, on Facebook. They can find me under Art Lewin or Art Lewin Bespoke. If you go to my website, www.artlewin.com -E uh, or Art Lewin. Just Google Art Lewin. I'm all over the place there. Awesome. Right. So we'll, we'll put those links in the show notes. Thank you so much. I'd love to see the, the, the tape later on, of too. Of course, of course, of course. Thank you so Thank much. You, I appreciate you. it. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you for your time. Bye-bye.